Good morning. Welcome to our budget committee. My name is Lene Palmasano. I'm the chair of this committee. I'm joined here this morning by council members Fletcher, Cunningham, Schrader, and Goodman. Um, so we have many department presentation, many departmental presentations today, and I will try to stay on track. We'll, I'm sure, have more people joining us as time goes on. Um, the first up uh, of departments today is the health department uh, director, Musicant. You seem ready, and it's nice to see you. Well, thank you. I'm glad I seem ready. Hopefully. I will appear ready as well. Um, good morning. I'm Gretchen Musicant. I'm the Commissioner of Health for the City of Minneapolis, and I'll be talking to you about the Mayor's recommendations for the 2020 budget for our Health Department. So first off um, is our organizational chart, and there are a couple um, things that have changed over the last year. Um, we uh, have created the Office of Violence Prevention and have um, hired uh, Sasha Cotton to be the director there, so that's a new um, office within the department and uh, reporting to me. And then uh, Dan Huff, who had previously um, operated our environmental health program, has now become an assistant commissioner at the State Department of Health. And so just uh, this week announced that Cindy Weckworth will be the new director starting on Monday. <coughs> So a review of our current service level changes from 2019 going into 2020. Um, in our family and early childhood area, you'll see that there's a 24% drop between the two years. Um, we had received a federal grant, um, the Healthy Start grant, for about 15 years or so, and were not refunded um, at our last application, and so that is is where that reduction has come from. We continue to uh, seek dollars um, for home visiting and other approaches to address infant mortality. On the school-based clinic program, you'll see a 17% drop. Uh, that is uh, reflecting a federal grant that goes um, flows through Hennepin County to us to address sexual health and teen pregnancy prevention that will be coming to its term end in 2020. Um, in youth development and sexual health, uh, there's a 5% reduction um, due to some one-time funding uh, that you allocated for sex trafficking that is not in the mayor's recommendation. Under the Office of Violence Prevention, that reduction is due to some one-time funding that was GVI related, and you will see that there is a mayor's recommendation for some um, additional funding. Uh, no change in senior services, lead poisoning, and healthy homes. Uh, you'll see an increase. Uh, that is really just due to adjustment between years um, for a HUD grant that we have. Um, the three-year grant ends in 2020, and so we will need to finish spending all the money in 2020, and so that's why it shows up there. Uh, no changes in emergency preparedness. Food, lodging, and pools, there's a reduction um, primarily in uh, the FTEs. Uh, there was one-time funding for two health inspectors uh, that will be, um, that one-time funding ends at the end of 19. You'll see that there is a recommendation for a portion of that uh, from the mayor. Um, environmental services, no change. A healthy living initiative, you'll see growth in that area. That's due to a grant from the Center for Disease Control that flows through the State Health Department to us. So those are the projected changes. So on to the mayor's recommended uh, change items. I think we all agree that we are trying to make sure that the young people in Minneapolis have uh, good futures and good jobs. And uh, one way to do that is to connect them with STEM education, science and math um, education. And uh, there are programs to do that. But one missing piece is that sometimes those jobs feel like, what is that job? What, what kind of job would I get with those kinds of skills? And yet we know that we're doing a lot of really innovative work within our department to address climate change and environment. And so making a connection for young people to see that there's work in their own community that uses those skills is a, a promising area. And so we've been um, 
kind of sort of working away at working on that in the summer and now believe that it would be um, the time for us to have a staff person to really bring that up to scale. So we've been working with the Minneapolis Public Schools. They have a program called Guys and Gems, which is um, STEM education, and we'd be working with them to really expose those younger youth to all these opportunities in their own communities. And then secondly, we have been working on an approach that um, for older youth to um, get them not only exposed but to create a series of certificates for them so that they have something tangible that will help them pursue uh, different kinds of um, jobs in the future. And so uh, the recommendation is for an ongoing 45,000. Um, over half of this position then is matched with repurposing of environmental programs budget, including salary savings and cutbacks in other areas. Fast Track is a program addressing HIV AIDS. In 2018, the City Council passed a resolution to make us a Fast Track city. Uh, Fast Track has four goals, um, that 90% of persons living with HIV will know their status, that 90% of persons living with HIV are retained in care, and that 90% of persons living with HIV are virally suppressed, and finally, that there is zero stigma and discrimination. And so we have used this last year to create a, an advisory group and to work with the with community and with the county to really discern where is the county working heavily in this area and where are the areas that we as a city can complement their work. And so the request is for one-time funding, um, $50,000, to address two of the 16 recommendations of Fast Track. One is stigma reduction, and the second will be to work with clinics so they become Fast Track certified, so that when people go to clinics, they are um, uh, handled appropriately in terms of testing and treatment. The department has um, applied for and received $20,000 from Robert Wood Johnson as matching funds. Group violence intervention has been uh, quite a successful approach, especially in North Minneapolis with young people who are group affiliated or gang affiliated and involved in violence. Since launching in 2017, um, GBI has helped reduce the number of group member involved non-fatal shootings in North Minneapolis. During a summer period from May through September in 17, that it dropped 55% and then in 18, an additional 40% drop. We now know that we need to move and think about what kind of adaptation needs to be done in order to use this same approach in South Minneapolis. We've done some preliminary work this year, but the recommended um, allocation from the, from the mayor is uh, to um, move with more aggressiveness in developing that south side approach where we're looking at more culturally relevant approaches for American Indian, East African, and Latino communities in South Minneapolis. A recent federal grant to our community partner uh, will allow us to uh, redirect additional funds to South Minneapolis as a match for this recommended uh, allocation in the mayor's budget. Healthy living and low-income housing. Studies have shown that um, Somali immigrants uh, were relatively healthy in 2001, but that by 2015, a growing percentage of both men and women experience unhealthy weight and diabetes. And so this recommendation is to work with um, uh, Minneapolis Public Housing Authority Cedars um, buildings to um, really increase the access to um, healthy foods, physical activity, and quality health care. It's an approach we've used in some of the other um, Minnesota public housing um, high rises, and we believe that um, focusing on the Cedars will bring us an el elderly population and one that's predominantly East African and um, appropriate um, for this intervention. We have a CDC public health associate who is a loaned staff person to us who will be helping us to implement that and serve as a match for this recommendation. Health inspector. Um, this year there was a, a study of the work of, of our health inspection um, program and we were found to be sort of 
In the middle, in the mix, uh, average amongst our peers in terms of the amount of staff, that was uh, counting the two folks that were had one-time funding in 2019. So the mayor is recommending um, that there be uh, one-time funding in 2020 for one FTE, which will result in a reduction in our, in our uh, staff complement. Um, <clears throat> We, uh, and it's not full funding, so the remaining funding for the position will come from reductions in restaurant operator training and education line item where we think we have some flexibility. We know that responding to opioid overdose and, um, and misuse is uh, occupying a lot of our resources as a city, police and fire and others. And um, we have uh, recommendations from the mayor's multi-jurisdictional task force on, on opioids. And so this recommendation of the mayor, from the mayor is uh, to implement some of those recommendations. One um, of the $405,000 you see there, 250,000, 405,000, I hope I said that, 250,000 of the total is to support the design and implementation of a hospital-based, community-based uh, program model, much like our violence prevention program that we call Next Step, but focused on those um, overdosing on opioids and intervening at that, that moment and helping them connect with resources and, and choose another path. And that is one-time funding. Um, there is also $50,000 of one-time funding um, in that amount to implement and support a syringe litter pickup initiative. The remainder of the funding uh, that is ongoing will support a staff person to coordinate all the work that's going on related to opioids. Uh, we have been able to uh, secure a U.S. Department of Justice grant, um, a three-year grant that will help us uh, carry forward that initial work on the next step like program, the hospital-based program. Um, and so we'll be able to come up with an $85,000 match over those three years. Each year of those three years. Um, if I could pause you there, we have a yes. couple comments or questions from my colleagues. Councilmember Fletcher. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. Uh, I'm really happy to see a big investment in opioid response. We know that that's a really important uh, area of public health right now. I guess I'm wondering about the uh, 50000 for the syringe litter pickup initiative. Um, is that enough or is that an area where if we were to invest more there could be more support for that? Because I know right now that's really running the fire department ragged and we're getting a lot of feedback from uh, community about syringes being left around and uh, the problem of that. So I just, is this a program that is uh, scalable to investment if we uh, wanted to look at ways to really make sure we are meeting that need, or is that, uh, do you feel like this does meet the need? Um, if I might, uh, well, Madam Chair, um, I'm going to invite our Deputy Commissioner, Noya uh, Woodridge, to answer that question. Ms. Woodridge, welcome. Thank you, Chair and Council Members. Um, <clears throat> the 50000 that is in there will cover the cost for this pilot year. We're piloting a number of initiatives to try to figure out the best way to take care of the, the syringe litter. And so 50,000 will cover what we are attempting at the end of this year and into 2020. Um, if the things that we are piloting work out, then we would want to grow them and do more of that, which would require more money. Thank you. Council Member Jenkins. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And Ms. Musicant, I was curious about a few slides back. Mm, you talked okay. about um, uh, GBI and expanding to the south side, mm -hmm. and um, I wanted to sort of understand what your thought processes are around um, some of the historical gang violence that has been uh, present in the South Side. Um, I know you mentioned um, Phillips and 
Franklin areas and Somali communities, but further south, you know, we've been seeing a, a really big, um, I would say, increase in gun violence and gang violence. And so, is there thoughts or plans about implementing programs around that? Yes, um, Madam Chair, Councilmember Jenkins. Yes, we um, we made some uh, uh, pilot attempts to combine some of the cultural groups in some of our approaches early on in mm -hmm. GBI, and really found that that is not an effective way to proceed. So, what we want to do as we as we move into South Minneapolis is really to tailor our approaches to the culture and communities there, so that the young people feel that it's really relevant, both in terms of the supports that we're offering them and the, the moral voice from the community. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, it's not, uh, it's not focused solely on the Somali community. The American Indian community is also very important, as is the Latino community. And so we're, we're developing both um, the moral voice capacity, but also the, um, the, the staff who have uh, knowledge in the community, but also can help um, people connect with the resources that might help them have a different uh, path. Okay. Um, yeah, no, I just, I'm really concerned that as we sort of shift crime around that it's gonna, you know, flow further south and then we need to come up with some additional strategies, so. Yes, and Madam Chair, Council Member Jenkins, uh, GBI is a really intensive, important strategy. It is not our only strategy. Mm -hmm. And so I think we wanna, <clears throat> we wanna have a, a, a combination, excuse me, <clears throat> um, and already are working with, with young people to um, connect them with resources that are not uh, focused on the on the gang activity, um, so yes, we want to be agile as well and respond um, to the need throughout the city wherever it occurs. Okay. Councilmember Goodman. Thank you, Madam, Madam Chair. Without getting into whether or not we should or should not be involved in the opioid needle issue, why wouldn't we pay for this out of the garbage recycling collection solid waste fund? I mean, I'm just very sensitive to items going on to the general fund, giving the tax situation we have, but it does make sense to me. If I represented a ward that had this problem, I would want this dealt with, so I'm supportive. But I do think that this is something should it, even for the $50,000 that should come out of solid, the Solid Waste and Recycling Enterprise Fund and not out of the general fund. Has that been discussed with finance staff or? Director Musicant, in your budget conversations, was it ever discussed if that would come from solid waste? Um, Council Chair Palmasano, no, we, we have not had conversations about the source of the funding, but maybe someone from finance could answer that. Yeah, Director Interman. So, uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Councilmember Goodman. The, um, that uh, specific idea was not discussed um, during uh, to my recollection, when this uh, item was being uh, added to the mayor's recommendation, I think uh, in general, our um, the source of funds for the solid waste and recycling fund are rates that folks pay for their garbage and garbage and recycling pickup, and so um, I think we would have to uh, look and see if it were appropriate for those monies to be used then for other though related services such as needle pickup um, we would have to consult with the city attorney's office on whether or not that would be allowable madam chair i would urge us to do that the fact that it got all the way downstream to someone like me to have to point this out i think is a problem i mean ultimately this is garbage, and it's hazardous garbage at that, and it likely would fit within the criteria of our solid waste and recycling fund. And I, I you know, I don't want to be bratty, but hello, property taxes are coming from everybody too. And so this is a significant issue, property taxes. So anything that is related to an enterprise fund that we, and this is such a small amount of money in the scheme of things, 
Um, I would think that at least at the budget office level, we'd be looking at whether or not enterprise funds could be paying for some of this. We certainly do that with the sales tax. We have many very broad ex examples of how we do it with sales tax, and I'm going to guess water, sewer, too. Uh, I, I can give you a bunch of examples over the years where we use the water and sewer fund for things that we're not exactly providing water in people's homes, but we're related to water and sewer. So I just know if it were me and I had this issue in my ward, I would be panicked. And so I do think we should do it. I just don't think it should come out of the general fund. Thank you, Councilmember Cunningham. Thank you, Madam Chair. I figured I'd go ahead and um, jump in. I know you have one more item, but I just wanted to, there's a couple of uh, points and questions that I wanted to make. Um, the first is with this um, environmental youth development STEM pathways. Um, you don't have to flip back to that because it's all the way at the video. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> um, I just want to point out to folks, like we have yet to really make explicit connections between the strategic and racial equity plan that we spent quite a lot of time pulling together. We have not made direct connections between the budget and that plan. And so I just want to explicitly name that this is something that aligns with the public safety goal, which is increasing the number of 10 to 24 year olds involved with um, youth development programming. So I just, I, we have not made those explicit connections, so I just wanted to name that. Um, I have a question around the health inspector. Um, so we had a rather robust um, is health inspection study that was done, presented to two different committees. Uh, my question is what kind of changes have come or will come from that study and how does this ask fit into those changes? Um, Madam Chair, Council Member Cunningham, uh, one of the changes that occurred almost right away uh, was um, changing the frequency of reinspections and um, for a certain level of, or, or changing the, uh, the numerical score for certain kinds of violations, which then impacted whether or not there would be reinspections. Did I say that correctly? I did. Um, and so we made that change uh, right away, and actually that will also um, influence uh, something that will uh, become um, part of the new website, which is we're going to start showing um, the scores, if you will, for restaurants, but it'll also make it possible for the restaurants to start with a higher score because we aren't uh, representing every kind of violation, only those violations that are health related. Um, so I think that's the main change that's happened. Um, I think uh, the, the finding of the study was that the level of staffing that we had at the time of the study, which includes those two staff people that are um, on one-time funding that will end at the end of 19, um, found that we were basically appropriately staffed, not overstaffed, um, and so the loss of those will bring us into a different place. So this one inspector brings us not into as much of a loss, and so it keeps us closer to that average place. Great, thank you. Um, I know that one of the other parts of the study was around um, special permits. Um, it, will there be, has there been any conversations around, because I know that that was a large part of eating up a lot of capacity for inspectors. Has there been conversations around how to re restructure that so that it is not so burdensome? Because it's kind of like a workaround right now and that is, has felt unsustainable for the level of staffing. Has there been conversations following up on that? Mm, there was one, yes, there have, conversations have begun. Great. Okay. Um, I also just want to name that it's really important, I think, for us as a council when we um, ask for s staff to take on studies, um, that we are explicitly connecting those studies to budgets and policy changes. So mm -hmm. just want to make sure that we're, we're naming that. Um, and I just want to build also on Council Member Goodman's point um, that I do think it's important for us to think about um, cross-departmental uh, cross collaboration. So if solid waste and recycling, um, which I agree would be the best response to this and how we invest in it from that, how do we take the expertise from the health department and work um, across those departments in order to be able to best execute this challenge, addressing this challenge. And then the last um, 
Conan, I have. I know that you don't have Sasha here today, but I wanted to ask about GVI. Um, so, how would you say um, a big component of GVI is collaboration with the police department? So, I'm curious as to how that collaboration is working, and um, is there anybody who is doing violent crime? data analysis and connecting that directly to GBI? Uh, Madam Chair, Councilmember Cunningham. Um, yes, I think that the GBI program has continued to solidify that um, working together between the police department and social services and the health department and the community around, around these issues. Um, we have benefited from consultation from John Jay College, which um, has continued to come and give us regular input and, and advice and help the police and um, all of us think um, about what's the best practice and how to get that um, to happen here on a consistent basis. Um, I am working uh, with the chief at the mayor's direction to um, identify resources so that we can continue to have that consultation support from yes. John Jay College, which has ended, um, and we're in the process of identifying some resources for that. Um, They've been generously supporting us without payment for a while, a little since while Since April, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. And I forgot the second part of your question. Around um, violent data analysis, because oh. um, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, I don't think that MPD has a violent crime data an analyst. So is that, a, I, I just feel like that would be a gap in information that is needed for GBI to be most effective. Um, how is the data then flowing and like how are the analytics happening around violent crime so that we are deploying the resources where they're needed? Um, Councilmember Paul Masano, uh, Councilmember Cunningham, um, I have not actually been at the meetings that are held to look at the data where Sasha does attend, um, and so would be speaking out of my imagination. But I believe that um, there is a rigorous look at the data in in those terms, in terms of identifying who parties are um, who might need um, visits or to be part of the call-ins that we held, that we hold. I did have a conversation with uh, one of the people who was here from John Jay College this week um, about our, our need to have some overall um, research that really um, solidifies the, the work that we're doing here. They have um, uh, sort of process research, but that uh, a partner um, with a university or something to create a more in-depth research on the kind of help that we are offering through GBI here and in other places across the country uh, would really help elevate um, the, the science. And so she agreed and, and we're going to look for opportunities for funding for such a thing, which I think is beyond the question that you asked me. But um, yes, yeah, so I We'll have to get back to you on, on uh, the analytics that are possible at the police department, whether or not they're sufficient, which I think is what you were asking. Yes, yeah, so I want to make okay. sure that there's just a clear flow, information flow, mm -hmm. because this inherently is a cross-departmental effort. Mm -hmm. We need information from the city attorney's office. We need information from MPD so that we have a clear flow. Um, we have really amazing folks who are on the ground doing the work. Um, and uh, like we just had a call in in my ward, uh, what was that, a few weeks ago. And so, you know, I know that the work is happening. I just have some, some concerns around some potential missing links. Um, and I know that there are weekly shoot meetings, so talking about shootings, but not necessarily violent crime and specific gang that I, so I know that there are gaps that are happening between connecting between the Office of Violence Prevention and the other departments. So um, I think it's important, like as we're adding more resources, that we're also being efficient in the systems that we're creating. And, and having deep conversations about where the gaps are so that we can help build capacity and we execute it to the best of its ability. So thank you so much. Yes. Councilmember Jenkins. Actually, thank you, Madam Chair. Actually, I just would just echo um, Councilmember Cunningham's concerns about capacity in the Office of Violence Prevention and, um, and GBI specifically. These 
you know, challenges are um, impacting multiple parts of our city, and we know that um, a lot of our residents are deeply concerned and thinking about more, um, I guess, carceral solutions, but I think that these interventions from the Office of Violence Prevention are going to be more effective, and so how do we build the capacity to, to be able to do that? Madam Chair, Councilmember Jenkins, I'm going to just going to take that as a positive comment. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Shall I move to our last slide? Sure. Um, uh, in regards to the health inspectors oh. slide that's okay. up, though, I think okay. it seems that you're connecting the study that you did with the budget. So the changes that you made seemingly reduce the workload. And the study said we were staffed appropriately, but for an old way of working, right? So if we change the way that we work, we should be able to do with less staff on the health inspector end. Is that kind of the summary? Yep. We're going to see how this goes, but yeah. Thanks. Yep. So the last slide um, is uh, lead poisoning and asthma prevention. Um, for many years, we've been making really great progress in terms of uh, intervening at lower levels of uh, lead exposure in children and, and bringing the resources that we have from the federal government to help change um, structures and homes so that children have safer environments. But if we're real, it's um, less desirable undesirable to be using children as the indicator for lead and it would be much better if we worked on homes without having a child in task um, lead poisoned first and so this proposal um, begins to move us more aggressively in that direction um, we are working with regulatory services so this is a joint um, proposal between regulatory services and uh, Minneapolis or in, in the health department and um, what we propose to do is have a position that is a health department position, but that is embedded in regulatory services that would really take advantage of the housing inspection work that's going on there, um, giving more capacity to those uh, folks to identify and respond to indicators of lead. Um, there's this kind of an alligator uh, look that paint has when there's lead in it, uh, chipping paint. There's ways that um, we can identify risky households and we have also done some analysis looking at where are the 5,000 highest risk properties for children and so trying to focus geographically um, on housing proactively and then trying to bring resources forward to help those um, homeowners or rental property owners um, make the change and so um, the recommendation is uh, for $60,000 and then that will be matched by the health department and regulatory services each uh, with uh, $37,500 of redirected funds to make one position. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Are there any further comments or questions from my colleagues? I'm not, I'm not seeing any. Oh, yes, I am seeing one. Council President Bender. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm really happy to see this um, collaboration with Reg Services. And when we talk about public safety and community health, this issue of lead poisoning in children is so huge and the damage is irreparable. Um, so the fact that we have children living in unsafe, unhealthy housing that's causing them, you know, a lifetime of issues is, you know, I think not okay, to put it simply. And so I'm excited to see that we're leveraging the resources of the health department and reg services together with our new initiatives to be more proactive in housing inspections. We have a $2 million revolving fund now so that we can, um, you know, do tenant remedy actions on behalf of tenants, get into the buildings, fix them up, and then come back and get recuperate the funding from landlords. We're being much more aggressive and taking on landlords with a pattern of behavior, both us and now we're seeing other partners as well, including the Attorney General's office. So I think we're in a time where this work is really accelerating and I appreciate the health department's leadership on this because you've been doing this for many years. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Cunningham. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Um, I also just wanted to build on what Council President Bender just said. Um, for folks to understand the 
catastrophic nature of lead poisoning. Um, we are talking about children who are typically developing and then at six years old can be, exper can be exposed to lead poisoning and then they regress to the point of losing language of, uh, among other developmental milestones that they had already reached. They will regress past or back beyond that. Um, and behaviorally, when we talk about public safety, that is actually like a huge component that we are not really talking about is that lead poisoning causes impulsive behavior. It causes aggression. It causes violence. It causes um, a multitude of health problems. And so when we look at the comprehensive public health approach to public safety, literally the health of children directly impact public safety outcomes. And so, um, you know, it's it, it, we have like I, I have some blocks in my ward where there are a certain per, like a small percentage of homes that can poison more than 30 kids over a certain period of time because it's rental. And so they one family comes in, it's probably a precarious housing situation. They leave and then the, the kid gets poisoned. They move and then it just keeps happening over and over again. So I just want to say thank you for the cross departmental collaboration on this. I think that this is um, a health um, issue as well as a housing issue and so I think it's really important that we're bringing those expertise together um, but I really just want to, to lift up the point around public safety and how that fits into this as well. Mm -hmm. This is a, a really important investment and I think it's important for us to continue, continue it forward. So thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you Director Musicant. Um, next we have oh. the Youth Coordinating Board. Welcome. Madam Chairperson, members of the committee, I'm Ann DeGroote, I'm the Executive Director of the Minneapolis Youth Coordinating Board. With me today is Judy Pickering, who is our Finance Manager and has been with us for 22 years. So it's always a pleasure to have Judy with me at these meetings because she knows history that I don't, which I appreciate. <clears throat> Minneapolis Youth Coordinating Board, I think you know, is a joint powers board. We bring together the City of Minneapolis, Hennepin County, Minneapolis Public Schools, and the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board to work on behalf of children and young people in our city. Uh, one of the things we most recently have been working on that most of you, I think all of you, have cooperated with us on is the ward meetings last year that were uh, hosted by yourselves and the Minneapolis Youth Congress to find out information from young people about what they think the city ought to be like so that we can incorporate their views into that youth master plan. The first portion of that master plan is finished. It was approved by the YCB board in October and uh, you'll be hearing more about it in the early part of next year. So we're very pleased with that plan and there will be a second piece coming up in the spring and summer. Council members Cunningham and Gordon are uh, your representatives to the Minneapolis Youth Coordinating Board and the mayor is also on the Minneapolis Youth Coordinating Board. So we are an intermediary organization. The question comes up often about who are you and what do you do? It's a good question. We are intermediary, which means that we work in between other organizations to help provide services and programs, which we do not ourselves provide. One of the most beneficial things about this role in this organization is that for the last 35 years, almost 36, and by the way, we're the oldest of our kind in the country, and we're one of the very few that brings together more than one jurisdiction. Um, but one of the most beneficial things that we can do is call on our partners and, and use their expertise and their help to make sure that things work well for our children. Our partners also call on us for our expertise and the things that we are able to help them with. But it is important that we can do these five things. We convene, we collaborate, we champion policy alter initiatives, we communicate with our partners and the community at large, and we create new pilot projects that I think are very helpful and useful that are often taken on by others. We don't often keep things. We sometimes give them to other people to do. We, the, the funding that the city of Minneapolis gives us is $361,000. 
$306,000 of that is what we refer to as YMAP, which is an old term that isn't in the budget anymore, but it's Youth Minneapolis After School Programming. But it's used for a little bit broader purpose, but it is used for youth development, um, those funds are. Um, part of the funds go to Minneapolis Community Education, some goes to the Minneapolis Park Board, and some goes to Hennepin County Teen Tech Centers in Minneapolis. And those are all programs that work with young people after school, on the weekends, uh, generally in what we call after school. By, today, by the way, today is Lights on After School Day. You will see the Lowry Bridge and the 35W Bridge lit up gold in honor of uh, after school. So it's a great day for me to be here on Lights on, Lights on After School Day. So those three programs are programs that we support with the funding that you make available to us. In this particular time, it is really important for us that we continue to provide that support. Support for after school funding in Minneapolis has decreased significantly in the last 12 years. We estimate it somewhere in the uh, range of $10 million. Just this year, the um, city of Minneapolis has found that they're gonna lose $2 million through a federal funding stream that comes through, through the State Department of Education called 21st Century Community Learning Center Grants. And our Minneapolis public schools benefit greatly from that money. They will not be receiving it this year. Um, in conversations with folks at the Department of Education who make those decisions in a community-based project uh, process, we understand that it has nothing to do with quality. Our quality is very high. It has to do with not enough funds. So decisions have to be made. I'm happy to provide other information for you about that at some other time, but um, it is very disturbing. It means that three Minneapolis public school after school programs are now having to be reconfigured. One of those schools, Stanford, is going to a fee-based model, and two of the schools are going to have to limit the, what they do because they just don't have the funds to do it. Um, and that in the context of a loss of after school funding is really actually pretty devastating. So we feel, we feel very much committed to these three entities with this amount of money that we can give them because it is helpful and it is money that use, is used to support young people who would not otherwise be able to use those programs. Um, we also, uh, this money also supports the uh, Minneapolis Youth Congress. We're in our 12th year of the Youth Congress. Next Thursday, a week from today, they're gonna take the oath of office down in the atrium of City Hall. You are welcome to join us. Be there from five to seven. Uh, the mayor's going to welcome folks. We have Senator Dibble and Senator Patricia torres Ray, and uh, Congresswoman Ilhan Omar are coming. So we're very enthusiastic to watch our 50 young people raise their hands and take the oath of office. The Youth Congress exists so that we can have engagement and the perspective of young people in the work of the YCB, but also throughout our four public jurisdictions. And your jurisdiction makes very good use of the Youth Congress, which we are delighted by. The Health Department, Minneapolis Employment and Training, the police really make good use of our young people and their expertise. Um, and I think it's enriched folks' work, and it's certainly enriched them, because we hear from them later when they're in college about what they learned with us that they use in college. So it's an excellent program. And uh, this fun these funds that you give us are used in part to support that. The last area of support is um, $55,000, which is used for downtown outreach in the summertime. That money is um, matched with $30,000 from the Downtown Improvement District. This provides adult youth outreach workers who work downtown to engage young people and help them think about what they might do, where they might go, what might happen. Do they have problems, questions? Do they need a resource like housing? Do they need food? But we provide a buffer downtown for our young people. We've been doing this since 2012 we feel we've been very successful. Uh, I just ran into Shane Zahn two days ago and he said, hey, another great year, thanks. So we feel very happy about that program. That program also exists in a couple of other places in the city. We work in Henry High through the school year. We have a full component of staff up there with Henry High School uh, all year. We also do some work on the north side in conjunction with the Minneapolis Health Department. 
and a grant that they received from the CDC. And new this year, we've been working in the Cedar Riverside neighborhood, providing uh, outreach services there as well. Um, that funding from last year has not been included in this budget. We would love to continue working in Cedar Riverside if there's a way for us to do that. Um, we think we've made an impact there and we think we can continue to make an impact. I should tell you our model is that we hire adult youth workers who are from the communities in which they're working. So we don't stick someone in who the young people don't know. Um, and it's a very good model and it works quite well. So I just want to make that I guess plug, shameless plug, but that outreach work in Cedar Riverside, I hope can continue as uh, our downtown work can continue. Um, I counted today, we reached 7,638 young people in our downtown outreach work. So I'm very uh, proud of that. And then if we go on to the uh, current service level changes and the budgeting, um, there's, of course, the joint powers fee, which you see here, which is a different fund. It comes out of CDBG funds. It doesn't come out of the general fund. And that's, of course, uh, as part of a joint powers agreement that you've agreed to already. So there's that funding. And then you see the other funding that's listed there that uh, no change has been recommended in this year. I'm happy to answer questions or elaborate on anything further that you might want me to do. I can talk for a very long time. so. So you might want to keep that in mind. I'm happy to meet with people personally, too. We have a couple in queue. Um, Ms. DeGroote, Mr. Cunning, uh, Council Member Cunningham. Thank you. I haven't been called Mr. Cunningham since I left the classroom. Thanks. Um, <laughs> um, thank you for this presentation. I was hoping that you could speak to some of the um, outcomes that after school programming provides because a lot of times when people think about young people they think about education and um, achievement in the classroom um, but as a former youth worker myself doing out of school time programming can you talk more about what the outcomes are that are provided by that and why it's so important that we invest in it yes Madam Chairperson and Councilmember Cunningham, that's an excellent question and I'm glad for it. Um, because a lot of times when we work on after school funding, we run into an obstacle of people not understanding why. Why should we do that? You know, isn't that something their mom should do? Or shouldn't they, is it babysitting? And after school funding has some significant impacts. In a study done about five years ago, it was found that young people who engage in after school funding who are from um, areas of poverty uh, increase their ability to do math and reading in school. So it impacts their school day. So one of the outcomes is that after school programming for many young people gives them some confidence and gives them some um, some place where they can do something well and fun that helps impact the rest of their school day. Um, and so that's one outcome that we've seen and that is a piece that's going to be studied more and more because we need to understand that a little bit better. It also keeps our kids safe. And when some of the biggest proponents for after school time are police, and when the United Way uh, cut their funding to after school programming about two years ago, the first people who noticed it were the police. And the officers on the north side said to our outreach team, what's going on? Why are all these kids here? And, be, and they understood that it was because there was no place for them to go. So it keeps our kids safe. People who work in pregnancy prevention consider it a time to keep girls from getting pregnant. And um, the federal bill on after school is called, um, is called three to six because it's the hours of three to six. So they've been able to capture that number for their bill in the in in the federal government. Um, the other thing that I think that it does is it really helps our working parents. And so many of our parents uh, work, some because they want to, but many because they have to. And this is a way that they know that their children are engaged in positive activities uh, after school until they get home. And that's, I think, a very important aspect of this that we sometimes don't want to talk about because we don't want to get into the argument about is this babysitting, but it's actually not. It's, it's quite more, a bit more than that. The old term for after school is enrichment. And I think it's actually a really good term we should bring back because after school programming really does enrich the lives of our children and it helps them to do better in the rest of their life. The last thing I would say about that is that it helps young people have uh, skills that they're going to need to have in 21st century 
when you read any data about what corporate CEOs want in their employees, the skills they're talking about, communication, conflict resolution, those kinds of skills are things they learn in after school. So it's a critical need in our community and when it's not there, we notice, we're gonna notice it this summer, I think. Yes, I, I would agree with that. Um, thank you for that, that information. There's a lot of research that backs up the importance of out-of-school programming, and I also call it enrichment quite often because I feel like that more accurately captures what the work does and the, yes. what it produces. Um, I would like to share with my colleagues that research has also shown that for every dollar that is invested in after-school programming returns about seven to twelve dollars worth of various social costs. Um, so, for example, jail, like young people being jailed in some way, or the various uh, other social resources resources that they would need. Um, and so, I think that's a huge return on investment um, that we really should be talking about. And there is quantifiable data that proves that. Um, it also improves school attendance. Um, that is also something that has been demonstrated. Uh, school attendance, chronic absenteeism is one of, if not the greatest indicator as to whether or not a kid is gonna graduate from high school. And so, um, and we know that graduating from high school is connected to a whole slew of other life outcomes. And so, uh, so this is a critical factor. And again, talking about public safety, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, peak time for kids to be uh, victims or perpetrators of crime is during the seven, uh, two to seven time period. And so for us, having kids not only not engage in maladaptive activities and behaviors, they're actually plugged into very healthy, um, enriching activities that are helping them become, that will help them to develop into well-adjusted adults who are competent and confident and uh, connected to their communities. I would really um, highly recommend for my colleagues to um, attend one of the Youth Congress meetings. Um, first of all, I think the kids would really appreciate that. Um, and But also to see what a true asset they are. Um, we are very lucky to have that um, very brilliant group of young folks helping advise us and so I, I think that it's necessary for us to really be present, validate them and, and recognize um, what a valuable asset that they are. Um, and then I will ask just one last question. Um, so I know that we have the, the Y map work uh, or fund that um, is really kind of money allocated to other jurisdictions. $151,000 of that is others is the Youth Congress and then some of our internal work. Yeah, okay. So um, do we have, so you have funding at the, the federal level that is the 21st Century um, Community Learning Centers. Thank you. Grant. <laughs> um, there's that funding and then funding was cut during at the state level. So we saw cuts at the federal level. Um, at the state level, what was the Palenti administration cut um, after school um, Correct. programming funding? And uh, but now there's like a little bit more thanks to Fuli, my state representative. So thank you. It's like what three million for the whole state, I think. Uh, council member, that hasn't passed yet. Oh, it hasn't. Never mind. It has not happened. So good work, Fu, for trying. Yes, um, absolutely. And then, do we have? any sort of fund that exists here at the local level that can help us be able to still support out of school time programming with youth serving nonprofits outside of larger jurisdictions like um, Minneapolis Continuing Education and MPS and um, the parks for, in the libraries. Madam Chairperson, Council Member Cunningham, no. Um, it is, though, a conversation we are having at the Youth Coordinating Board about how can we create a fund that helps support some of this work, some of the money which has been lost, um, to make sure that all of our young people have access to quality after school activities. And then how can we make sure the work we do now, in part with this funding, is to ensure quality of those programs. Because I think you also know the data is that, that if a program isn't quality, you might as well not go. Yes. It's, you might as well keep your kids home watching TV. So we try to ensure the quality of the programs through our work, but there is no other fund right now unless somebody gets a grant from a foundation, and those are less and less uh, possible. 
Um, so we are talking actively at the Youth Coordinating Board about how could a fund like that be created using a public funding stream and then augmented by private dollars. Yep. And maybe some other creative ideas about how to augment that fund. So, so I'm very happy you asked that, but that is an active conversation right now. We're, we've actually done some research about what they do in other cities, and we have some background materials about that that we're looking at. Right. Um, I just really want to emphasize to my colleagues, and this will be my last point. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I just want to make the point that our public safety goal for this city is increasing the number of young people ages 10 to 24 to high quality youth development programming. This is exactly what we're talking about and there is no fund for it. That's right. Um, and so, and that is actually one of the projects that are identified by the public safety goal is the creation of this fund. So that we went through a strategic and racial equity planning process and the goal that was identified for public safety, which is top of mind for many, many of us, um, that is not directly addressed in this budget. So I just want to, to name that, yes. um, that there is a disconnect between this uh, strategic and racial equity action plan and this budget. So thank you very much for the information and thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome. We do want to get going shortly, but we have a couple more comments or questions in queue. Councilmember Gordon. Thank you. I'll try to be brief. Um, certainly support all the work that's going on and appreciate the crisis in um, out of school time and programming for youth and youth development. But there was one um, thing I was disappointed not to see in the proposed budget, which was continuing work that we've been doing on children's savings accounts. This is something that Mayor is looking at, at of St. Paul, looking at very carefully. We've studied it on the YCB, looked at what other cities and states are doing and school districts in terms of creating a little um, savings account for um, youth of their city um, to be used later for to help um, for college. And I know that we had a model and a pilot that we could look at, particularly focusing um, those first seed accounts um, where um, perhaps it was most needed to repair some of the historic damage done to some of the um, families in our city. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering where that is at. I actually um, know that there's some problems with state law and there may, needs to be some changes and even St. Paul seems to have got a carve out that would, would allow them to do this um, in state law that we didn't get included in necessarily. I went with the uh, um, chair of the county board and we um, talked about this with um, um, state officials and I think we, um, if we can carry the work forward for another year we may see a pathway that could work very well and I wonder um, are we keeping that uh, uh, hope alive and are there some strategies and some needs and did you request funding to, to keep this going and, and how much did you request? Madam Chairperson, Councilmember Gordon, thank you for that question. It's a very important issue. We've spent about three years on it. Um, I did request funding of about, uh, I believe it was $43,000. That's what we received last year for that. And I might have the number wrong, but I will get that to you, Council Member, so that you know what we requested. Um, we actually are pretty much ready to go with some policy work on this um, to try to expand the waiver that the state gave St. Paul to include Minneapolis and have spoken with uh, Jean Ranieri in the IGR department and also with Hennepin County IGR staff. So um, our, our work would be to, first of all, get that obstacle out of the way because that is an obstacle to actually starting the accounts. And we have, a, we have a way to do that. We have a plan. We're really ready to go. We have the information we need. And secondly, we need to be able to put this um, plan into action, which we have been working on, um, in terms of looking at additional foundation support. We have kind of our pieces in place pretty much right now, which is great, about who will participate. Um, just we, we have kind of one piece that's not filled in yet. Um, but we also will be needing to put into place our relationships with the organizations who are going to help us find these children. Because as many of you may know, in, many, in Minnesota, um, we are not able to get birth data, birth records of children born to unmarried moms. And so that means the children generally most at risk are children we can't get from a public entity from the state. 
So we will be working with partner organizations like Northside Achievement Zone, the Longfellow School, um, home visiting programs to help identify who those children are so that we can create those accounts for them. So there's quite a bit of work to do. We're positioned to do it, um, but the, the funding was not recommended by the mayor, and I would hope that you'd be able to find a way to help do that. Thank you very much. I have a sense that if we just had a little bit of a investment from the city in it, we could leverage a lot more from the foundations and get the county to pay more attention yeah. and others as well. So that's something, colleagues, that I'm going to be looking at as a potential uh, amendment somehow in the budget, just to give you a heads up. Thank you. Um, Council Member, uh, Council President Bender, actually, before we, before we get, let me uh, yield the floor to Council President Bender, and then I have a couple of questions. Thank you, Chair. I can be brief. I did also want to just uh, underscore that uh, the City Council and Mayor had identified three priorities as part of the Strategic Race Equity Action Plan, and, and the one around public safety is so very specific and focused on youth access to programming, um, which, again, as Councilmember Cunningham stated, really isn't reflected in this proposed budget. And so, if um, so. At the very least, I think that means we need to be more planful for next year's proposed budget so that we hopefully get more of a robust um, proposal before us. I know when the Park Board came forward, the Park Board also requested funds that were not recommended by the mayor. Mm -hmm. um, I know the mayor had put a lot of weight into what the Youth Coordinating Board is recommending and feels like funds should all come, kind of be coming through this entity. And so that really elevates, I think, the need to make sure that we're seeing pretty big proposals coming forward from the coordinating board. Um, that doesn't mean the council has to sort of follow that logic, but um, but, but could. Um, so I you know, I don't think it's a small thing that the city council identified three specific things and one of them is, is not really showing up at all. So we should probably figure that out. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could you go back to the slide that show us all the different jurisdictions that participate in the youth coordinating board, please? Um, I think it's important to remember all the different um, partners here. One that we've heard a lot from this year in different things, budget asks, and actually raising the levy is the Park Board. Can you help us understand just how engaged the Park Board is in the Youth Coordinating Board? Because they are officially part of your board. Are they? Are they? showing up and asking us to do more here through through the Youth Coordinating Board? You know, there, um, Commissioner, uh, um, Madam Chairperson, Commissioner French is the representative to the Youth Coordinating Board from the Park Board. Um, and uh, he is also a member of the Executive Committee of the Youth Coordinating Board. Superintendent Bangora and um, Director Tyrese Cox attend the board meetings regularly of the Youth Coordinating Board. I am meeting with um, the superintendent next week to talk about a variety of things from the youth master plan all the way to a fund. So we're going to talk about a whole variety of issues. We work at the staff level regularly with the parks. We use the parks for meetings all the time and the staff are helpful for uh, with us in putting those meetings together, making sure young people come and know about the meetings. And so we have a very good relationship with parks. Um, we also know that all of our kids have access to parks pretty much unrestricted. They have to do something to not be able to be there, okay? And so it's a safe place by and large for our young people. And it is a active place for them. They're beautiful parks. They have excellent staff. So we're very supportive of our parks being um, a place that our young people can go and continue to go. So in that regard, it, it, we do a lot of work with the parks to make sure that that is happening and how can we be helpful to make sure that that is happening. It might be tonight. No, Friday and next week, we are, our Youth Congress is going to be facilitating two meetings for the Park Board Planning Department about space in Cedar Riverside. So they're going to be working with them on that, which is very, I think, helpful and exciting. They wanted young, people's, uh, young people to bring that voice to them. And in addition to that, one of the things that we've worked on with the Office of Violence Prevention is a system for what to do if a child is killed. 
How do we make space for our young people? What do we do to account for that trauma for them? And the parks have stepped forward as the place that will open space like this. So uh, we work with the parks all the time. Uh, we work with them quite a bit on our uh, youth master plan and uh, they're good partners in our work and we also really understand that they have the majority of our kids during time that isn't structured like school. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that's an important place of collaboration. I have to say I really appreciate the ongoing attention and care that um, the council members here in this council, Council Member Cunningham and Gordon, um, participate on Youth Coordinating Board with. So, yes. um, actually, Council Member Goodman has a question or comment. Thank you. Did you say how much money the Park Board puts into the Youth Coordinating Board? And I missed that number. They have a joint powers fee. Judy, do you know off the top? I bet she knows. A little over 16,000. Okay, so they put in 16,000 and we put in 400,000. Maybe we could have the budget office send us a list of how the youth coordinating board is funded with all the different jurisdictions and how much they pay. Sure. It's not a secret. Council Member Gordon's shaking his head. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Uh, moving right along, we're going to move on to the city clerk's office, which includes, oh, I'm sorry, Ms. DeGroote. There's another question or comment from Councilmember Fletcher. I did see that before. I'm sorry. Thank you, Chair Bowman. I'll, I'll, I'll be brief, but I, uh, I I just want to underscore what several of my colleagues have said. That uh, you know, one, if I have a sort of um, macro critique of of you know the mayor's budget as we think about the work of the council to um, you know make improvements to it as we as we move through this process, it is that it's a reduction in. Uh, investments in youth. Uh, mm -hmm. Both we just heard from uh, in public health about uh, reductions in investments in youth violence prevention programming, and then uh, we heard from CPED about uh, the main cut that they were finding, which just got kind of framed as like a uh, a, a cut without uh, value behind it, but it actually represented them abandoning a, a youth workforce development program uh, that you know maybe wasn't working, but uh, you know overall we're. This budget currently re represents a significant cut in investments in youth, and I think we're we're probably going to be looking for ways to correct that. I think we have a lot of people who are asking us right now uh, to figure out what to do about youth who we haven't been reaching, uh, and that's been a very difficult and frustrating conversation uh, where we're getting to people too late. Uh, there are not places for kids to be downtown. Um, there's not programming for them downtown, which is where we know they're often coming for safety, especially. Uh, you know, into the evening hours, and I think whether it's through YCB or through some of the private partners who uh, we know are uh, also working on this issue in coordination with you, I, th I think I'm going to be looking for ways for us to make some of those investments as we move forward in the budget process. So I'll look forward to continuing to talk with you uh, around ideas about how we can do that with some urgency. Madam Chairperson and Council Member, I just want to say I really look forward to that conversation because it is really something that has to happen now. It's not happened before. It's kind of a newer thing. The other thing I want to let you know is as part of the Youth Master Plan, we are doing children's budgets for each of our jurisdictions. And we have been working with, um, with uh, Micah on the cities and his you were first so we could test it and it was a perfect place to test it because we got a lot of help. And that budget will hopefully give you information about what the city invests now and what the other entities invest. And we're not just looking at like schools, of course, are all for kids. We're looking at it at a little deeper level about what kind of funds there are and what they're used for. So we will look forward to showing that to you later and I hope that will help in with the question that you have. Thank you all. Thank you for your time. Um, moving right along, we're gonna invite up our city coordinator, Mr. Casey Joe Carl to give us, I, I will be the city clerk. I'm sorry, did I say coordinator? Why, I thought you coming. <laughs> you coordinate so many things, Mr. Carl, <laughs> but it's true you're not the city coordinator. Mr. Clerk, you're here to go over the city council, city clerk, and elections budgets. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair. My name is Casey Carl. I have the privilege of serving as city clerk. If it pleases the committee, I'm here to present the mayor's 2020 budget proposals for city council for the Office of City Clerk and as a division of that office, the Elections and Voter Services Division. Combined, that department budget is proposed to increase approximately $4.2 million in 2020. Almost the entirety of that increase is tied to enhancements the mayor has included in his recommended budget tied to the presidential election as well as routine inflationary expenses for operations 
operations across the entire department. With your permission, I'd like to start with City Council, which begins on page 221 under section F in your budget book. Uh, so the City Council is composed of 13 members. Each is elected from separate ward. Based on our unofficial population projections, Minneapolis has an estimated 426,000 residents, which translates to roughly 33,000 residents per ward. While the official census numbers won't be known until March of next year, those estimates do mean that each council member represents a constituency that's larger than the city of Brooklyn Center. From a budgetary perspective, the city council represents just over $5 million with a full-time staffing complement of 39 positions. This slide explains that the city council, as the legislative and chief policymaking body of the city, functions in three basic capacities. First, in partnership with the mayor, the council enacts local legislation and public policy policies to protect and promote general health, safety, and welfare throughout the community. Second, the council oversees the administration of city government through its power of the purse and through regular program evaluations, audits, and general oversight of the city's many departments and divisions. And finally, in addition to those core legislative duties that are vested in the full council, individual members represent their constituents. As an extension of representational duties, council members also represent the interests and priorities of the city in a number of local, regional, statewide, and national organizations. These interest groups include, for example, the League of Minnesota City cities, the National League of Cities, and many more. This slide details the service level changes that have been included in the mayor's recommended budget for 2020. The council is projected to decrease slightly when compared to the current fiscal year, uh, despite inflationary increases. And that's because that our increases in inflationary costs have been offset by the elimination of $24,000 in one-time funding that was tied to the constituent relationship management system in 2019. Basic operating expenditures and staffing all remain consistent. There are no other changes included in the 2020 budget for city council. If I could pause you there, Councilmember Cunningham. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Um, I uh, earlier, I think it was at the end of last year, early this year, um, I had asked for a job analysis to be done for the council staff, um, given the amount of skills and the amount of work that they were expected to take on. Um, I'm curious about what the ultimate result of that was and what recommendations there are in order to um, pay our staff appropriately. Madam Chair, Councilmember Cunningham, the evaluation completed by the Human Resources Department has been submitted to me as the department head, shared with department or council leadership. Uh, there is a decision to be made at this point in terms of what what level of recognition those staff positions earn within the city's total classification system. Because those positions are politically appointed, they are not technically a part of the city's classified system of staff. So there was a first of its kind evaluation of political staff positions. The HR department uh, evaluated those positions in comparison to a number of select municipalities across the United States um, and provided some general feedback in terms of guidelines that should be considered when considering what those positions should be uh, paid, how they should be compensated and treated within the system of the city government, but made no specific recommendations on what to do. The council president, uh, as part of leadership, has asked uh, me to run some additional numbers in terms of comparing those to existing positions both within the center, uh, city enterprise and to other select cities that operate and are structured in populations that are very close to the city of Minneapolis. And so that analysis uh, has just recently been completed we have not had a chance I have not had a chance to get onto the president's calendar in order to get a decision on uh, what should be brought forward as a direction for the whole City Council great thank you so much I appreciate that Councilmember Schrader I just want to follow up on that and first you know thank the council member for requesting that study because I it, one of the like any business, the best thing we can do is just keep our really good employees. Um, and so in addition to just the uh, amount of compensation, what I find very limiting is just kind of how that role is defined. Like right now it is just a senior and a junior, and that doesn't give a lot of leeway for um, having two talented staff um, that share the workload differently. Um, so it isn't just about kind of the amount and the pay scale, uh, but just where those kind of job, um, the limitations of how we're allowed. Thank you. Council President Bender. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to 
echo what my colleagues have talked about and thank Councilmember Johnson who helped us unstick the HR study that had been kind of languishing for I think many months um, and Council Vice President as well who was involved. I think you know, I think this is a high priority for us um, in the short term making sure that our staff are paid fairly um, I think is one of my highest goals. I do think um, and, they're, and they're not, frankly, if you compare in any which way. If you compare internally to the mayor's policy staff, they're not paid fairly. If you compare to city staff doing similar jobs, they're not paid fairly. If they compare to other cities, they're not paid fairly. This is my assessment from the information that we've seen. Um, so I think we do need to take some action in the short term to make sure that our staff are fairly compensated. In the longer term, I do think it's also important for us to kind of reflect on the evolution of the city council's day-to-day um, -day um, work and I think council offices are doing significantly more policy work. Um, I've had conversations with the clerk and the coordinator and our city attorney's office because frankly the ordinances that I work on and there have been five just this year that my office is working on, um, you know, I think we have a need to, to create more transparency and consistency about how we approach policy work. You know, when does the public see a draft, you know, how is that draft developed, how many stakeholder meetings are happening, how do we do community engagement more consistently across policy work, because right now each time there's an ordinance or a policy initiative, they're kind of reinvented every time, and I think it creates confusion for our constituents and the public. I think often stakeholders, while we may be well-meaning in who we're trying to have at the table, often have so much more information than our constituents on what's happening, and that can happen over months or even years. Um, where there are stakeholder meetings happening about issues that are affecting our constituents' day-to-day -day lives and there's nothing that we can share publicly because we don't have a draft ordinance for months or years. Um, and so I think that a part of this question about compensation and staffing is, you know, what is the role of a council office in policy development? Our aides are doing communications, they're doing policy research, they're doing stakeholder engagement, they're doing negotiation, community engagement, things that I think perhaps are more appropriate for department staff to be doing, but it's not happening. Uh, but Or if we think that it's more appropriate for council offices to be doing that work, I think we need to really seriously think about how we're staffing the city council. I think there's lots of different um, models that we could learn from and look for, some which would have more consolidated staff that do policy research or administrative work for the council as a whole. Um, you know, looking at different models of staffing individual offices. But I think we are reaching a point of um, pr probably past where we should have um, really, you know, kind of helped sort of solidify these processes, solidify the roles of council offices versus other um, areas of the city enterprise and, and staff them appropriately. So I'll, um, I'm happy to continue to have those conversations. I, a lot of council members have been involved and I invite, you know, um, help and support from anyone. Um, I will jump in here and say that while they're not present right now, Councilmember Jenkins, Ellison, and I have been having conversations about how to better do that, um, more like what is the fair process, more from the lens of the transparency of the public to know our processes, to know how ordinances get done. That was part of the Council President's comment. Mr. Carl, did you want to add to anything else? Madam Chair, I would just say that in my tenure here, which is almost 10 years now, the role of council and council offices and staffers in particular has evolved and changed. What was largely focused on constituent services has broadened into policy work, into research, into constituent services, into administrative support of a council member, tying into the organization. So all of the comments made resonate with me in particular, and I do think that the council needs to consider how it wishes to operate in order to be effective in all of those three major buckets in which it operates, both legislative, oversight, of the departments and the city administration and constituent services. And I would say that um, my brief research in looking at other comparable councils would show that you are on the bottom tier in terms of how you staff yourselves and how you provide resources to meet your needs in comparison to those uh, city councils we would identify as comparables. Thank you. Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I just want to echo the concerns that others have raised and really the need for uh, fairly compensating our staff, which work incredibly hard and really need to carry a lot of different skills and uh, be high functioning in these roles. And I think 
They are underpaid, which is what we've found from research and looking around uh, at what other cities are doing in comparable jobs, and it's something we really uh, need to correct. I mean, it's a significant issue. They need to be fairly compensated. I don't think we should shy away just because they work for us, and so there's kind of this political aspect to it. It makes it really difficult. I know uh, my council colleagues that are returning know that uh, you know, there's difficulty in looking at things even like how council members are compensated, right? And so inevitably it uh, is a sensitive subject, but the reality is that these are really incredibly hardworking, talented individuals that are essential for the function of government and they deserve to be fairly compensated. I'll just, I'll just log that as a comment. Um, any other questions or comments from my staff? I'm from my colleagues. <laughs> um, we've been talking about staff. Are there any other questions from my colleagues? I don't see any. Madam Chair, that completed my review of the mayor's proposal for the council's budget. If there are no other questions, I'll move on to the clerk's office. Thank you. So the details for the office of city clerk begin on page 204 under section F in the budget book. Uh, the Office of City Clerk is the primary record-keeping agency of the city government. It fulfills this responsibility in two ways shown on this slide. First, as clerk of the city council, and second, as, custo as custodian of the city's information assets, which is to say its papers, its files, books, data, and other materials, as well as the city's archival collections and the city seal. From a budgetary perspective, the Office of Clerk represents roughly $5.5 million in 2020. That's an increase of about 1.2% tied to routine inflationary increases in its operation. This includes $3.9 million in general fund to support the core services of the clerk's office and then $1.6 million in internal service charges for the Document Solution Center, which as you know is a unit that operates within our records and information management division and provides business support services for the entire enterprise. The office of city clerk includes a total staffing complement of 26 full-time positions. This slide provides the synopsis of how those services and programs are divided to, between those two divisions in the clerk's office. This slide summarizes the fiscal impact of the mayor's recommended 2020 budget, which includes two change items I'll highlight in a moment. Again, you can see that the budget comparisons between 2019 and what is proposed for 2020 has an overall decrease in planned expenditures due to the elimination of one-time funding from 2019. So the first change request the mayor has included in his recommended 2020 budget is for $25,000 in one-time funds to support enterprise data review and redaction. This will enable the department to extend existing temporary personnel as a supplement to our very small permanent team that is responsible for handling all data requests for the entire city enterprise. That includes data capture, review, redaction, and release in collaboration with all 22 departments. The second change request is $100,000 in one-time funds for the third phase of the LIMS project, that's the Legislative Information Management System. The final project phase will address operating enhancements and the expansion of that system to include other boards and commissions in the enterprise. We also are excited to move LIMS to an outsourced, hosted environment with our partner, DataNet, and to continue to expand the data that's captured in this system as the city continues to migrate data from older, unsupported legacy systems. When fully implemented, the vision is for LIMS then to provide a single point of action access to all of the public data the city has tied to city council, the city council's committees, also the city's multiple boards and commissions, and to legislative data of the city of Minneapolis. Uh, that completes my review of the office of clerk. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take those, or I can proceed to the elections and voter services division. Councilmember Cunningham. I just want to very briefly um, speak praise for the LIMS work. Um, I have, um, I'm an active member of Local Progress, and I have many colleagues from across the country who are jealous of our LIMS system, so I just wanted to uh, let you know that um, I, as a policy nerd, love it because it's all consolidated. I've been able to show my constituents when they have questions how to be able to look it up. They can watch even the video. It pulls up directly the time that the conversation happened, and so um, there, it's clear that a lot of work and intentionality has gone into it, so I just want to thank you for your leadership and your due diligence on this. 
Madam Chair, Councilmember Cunningham, on behalf of the entire team who designed and built that, I will uh, say thank you for those compliments. If you are not aware, we recently launched a survey on the LIM site, so we're asking for public feedback, and I'm happy to share that the vast majority of that feedback is very positive along those same lines. Thank you. Would that be the survey that pops up every single time I go into LIM? Yes. That is the survey that pops up every single time. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other questions or comments from colleagues. Then I will move on to the Elections and Voter Services 2020 budget recommended by the mayor. Um, starting in 2019, this division has been accounted wholly separate from the Office of City Clerk in order to better track expenditures. Um, there's a very volatile nature to the elections budget just because of the natural four-year cycle and how much different elections cost. So programmatically, the details are uh, included within the Office of City Clerk in the budget book, and again, that begins on page 204. The Elections and Voter Services Division ensures the city is prepared to conduct an election whenever required. It also performs the duties that are prescribed under various federal, state, and local laws related to election administration. As Council is aware, there are three regular events scheduled next year in 2020, including a presidential nominating primary on Super Tuesday, which is March 3rd. And in addition, we will have the presidential primary, uh, the regular statewide primary in August, and the general presidential election in November. Given the anticipated potential historic levels of participation, the Elections and Voter Services Division represents significant growth in our budget, showing an increase of more than $4 million. As shown on this slide, there is projected increase of that more than $4 million for the 2020 fiscal year. While it does reflect significant enhancements that have been recommended by the mayor for the 2020 presidential election, it also reflects the fact that there were no elections conducted in 2019, so that the increase is adding election expenditures on top of an off year in the regular four-year election cycle. That makes it look a bit more than it would have been had we had a regular election this year. What this slide shows is the base budget does slightly decrease due to some cost allocation. The the department also does bring in some revenue due to a contract we have with the Minneapolis School District to conduct their elections. That contract for the next four-year cycle just went through the Ways and Means Committee and should be at the City Council for its regular meeting tomorrow. The mayor has recommended a total of three change items for 2020. This first one is an increase of $3.9 million to provide for the three election events I've discussed in 2020. This total allocation breaks down into three components as part of the division's base budget. First, it will provide the operating funds needed to administer those three election events. Second, it will enhance the planned base budget by adding a second 46-day early vote center during the absentee balloting period tied to the November general election. This will give voters in Minneapolis additional locations for in-person voting throughout that 46-day period. And it will allow us to operate three separate sites for in-person direct balloting during the final week of early voting leading up to the November 3rd presidential general election, which is, not that I'm counting, but 375 days from today. That continues the investments the mayor and council have made over the past several years to expand access to the ballot for all qualified voters in Minneapolis. And finally, in keeping with expanding access, particularly in communities that have been historically shut out of the voting process or which face greater barriers to access, the mayor has recommended an ongoing funding allocation of $90,000 to provide grants to community partner groups that engage with our Elections and Voter Services Division in its outreach and education work. That funding would be allocated through the One Minneapolis Fund, which is administered by the Neighborhood and Community Relations Department. That leads to the second enhancement recommended by the mayor, which is the addition of one position to lead the division's voter outreach and education initiatives and programming. As council is aware, outreach, education, and community-based partnerships have been an integral component of our success these past many years. However, given the existing staffing limitations, these efforts have been performed by contract and temporary workers. This enhancement secures a full-time position to have primary responsibility for leading that work involved in planning, organizing, and leading outreach and educational programs. If approved, it would increase the division staffing to seven full-time positions. Despite that increase, Minneapolis's elections division would remain the smallest in comparison to Hennepin and Ramsey counties. Hennepin County has 10 full-time positions but does not operate a single polling place. Instead, Hennepin County handles the back office functions tied to voter registration and ballot design. All voter-facing functions in Hennepin County are administered by cities, the largest of which is the city of Minneapolis. 
Minneapolis also has uh, been a statewide leader in voter outreach and education initiatives, including our tenant notice of voter registration ordinance, the voter information guide delivered to all households, the charitable organizations recruiting for elections, or CORE program, and several successful community partnerships like the Little Earth Make Voting a Tradition program. And finally, the mayor has recommended a one-time allocation of $35,000 to support the acquisition of a redistricting module and mapping tool in partnership with the Information Technology Department. The IT Department's GIS division uses Esri Arc GIS platform for its mapping functions, and this funding would allow us to acquire the Esri redistricting application to support our efforts uh, in supporting the Charter Commission in completing the next round of redistricting. Madam Chair, that completes my review of the mayor's proposed budget for elections and voter services. It also completes my review of the entire department. I'm happy to stand for any questions. Thank you, Councilmember Goodman. Thank you, Madam Chair. So a $4 million cost for this election edition is just a complete shock to me. That's over 1% increase in the total levy in and of itself. Um, I'm just wondering if you've done an analysis of mail-in balloting. You know, we don't have people come in person as much anymore. And so as we now have no excuse mail and no reason to given a reason why you have to vote in advance, I'm wondering how that and how many people who do that play into the need for this volume of funding to be spent on, on access to voting. I'm all in favor of access to voting. I understand the importance. I probably put more money into the census. I think that's a bigger issue in terms of Alloc resources allocated. We have a fairly high turnout in the city. I think the number is like up in the 80% range, right? So we have some work to do in areas that don't vote and we need those people to vote desperately. Couldn't we focus our efforts on early voting centers and places only where people historically don't vote as an example? I just feel like this is a massive one-time amount of money and money is needed all over the enterprise and other areas. I'm just wondering how early voting via mail ballot played into your thinking. Madam Chair, uh, Council Member Goodman, yes, we have done several analyses of projected turnout both in comparison to this current four-year cycle but over um, trends looking at past presidential elections which in and of themselves are uh, a unique uh, election to administer. A presidential almost always has the highest level of turnout and despite the fact that we've moved to no excuse absentee voting. For just one election, though, only one presidential have we done this. We've we've had one presidential election with no no excuse absentee right, voting. Just one, so there's not like a lot. Right, but the trend, however, has shown Councilmember that the vast majority of our voters still vote in person and on election day. So despite the growth we've seen in the last election, where we had I think it was around 12 percent turned out early, and of that, a big portion was in person early, not by mail. Um, our biggest turnout is on election day at the precinct in person and that with 134 precincts um, and a population that has grown and because we have to staff for same day registration so we do our analysis based on how many registered voters we know we have but we also don't know how many people might come to the polls and register that day and because same day registration requires an additional amount of support um, staff who can make sure to ser serve those voters which takes a longer period of time to get in and out of the poll in place. Uh, it's really staffing that drives the cost, one of the big issues. The other one is locations and rent for the facilities that we use on election day. We have three elections next year, so that also drives our cost. We are not certain what the presidential primary will be, or the presidential nominating primary in March. So we've done a best guess analysis on that. Uh, and while I also appreciate and, and share concerns about the cost. The costs that we've asked for and which are reflected in the mayor's budget are not out of the ordinary in comparison to what we've actually spent on elections over the last eight years. Madam Chair, but you said that the, this money is going for like 46 days of early voting and, se and three locations of seven days of early voting. Did I misunderstand you? Now you're saying people show up the most on the day of the election. So which is it? <laughs> Do we need to have them seven days in advance? Do we have to have three sites open seven days in advance when most people show up on the day of? 
Is most of the staffing for the day of? Is there a breakdown of what is the 46 days in advance? What is the seven days in advance? What the cost of renting those spaces is? I mean, I just really feel like this is a, we have so many massive pressing priorities. This is $4 million. This is one more than 1% of the total levy. And so I, it's hard for me to choke it down without understanding exactly how this is going to work. I can't imagine elections 12 years ago had that, that many fewer voters. We couldn't handle it. I guess if I saw that we overspent our budget by $4 million, then, then that might make some sense. But I would need to know more about what is going into what. There's no specificity in this. It just simply says one extra early voting station, 40 something days in advance, three extra voting stations, seven days in advance, but you're saying the biggest turnout's on election day itself. Madam Chair, perhaps I misspoke, Councilmember Goodman. That entire amount covers all three elections. In addition to covering the three elections, it's also covering the costs of a second 46-day early vote center. It's also covering the costs associated with those three additional direct balloting or early sites seven days before the election. Um, and I'm happy to meet with you and, and discuss further. We did have a presentation to the Intergovernmental Relations Committee yesterday, in fact, where Kate Redden from the EVS division presented a pretty good detailed breakdown of how we've experienced our early voting turnout. And it's mostly in person. It's mostly during that seven day period right before an election. Um, so I feel pretty comfortable with the analysis we've done and I can share that with you. Happy to provide more data as, as you would like to see it. Um, again, I would say that the projection we've made for 2020 is not off course for what we actually have spent in elections in past years when we actually did bust our budget. So I think that's a really important point. We usually do spend a lot. We just don't budget for it. Um, one difference in the time that I've been here is that you, my understanding is the elections office has always had to tap contingency money after the fact, but it's better to budget for it up front, and that's what this mayor is doing with this budget. Is that under, is that? Madam Chair, that's exactly on point. In, in my nine years here, except for last year, um, not last year, we didn't have a budget this year in 2019, but in 2018, we were successful for the first time in bringing in our election within the budget that was allocated to us, first time. And that was primarily due to the work of Mark Ruff in his capacity as Chief Financial Officer, and he deserves all the credit for that, um, because he saw this trend of budgeting less than what we knew we were going to spend, but then having to pay for it after the fact. So we're reversing course, which is where we're bringing that shocking number first and saying, this is what it actually costs to bring in the election. It's a big chunk. Um, we're gonna spend it, it's budget for it, instead of paying for it after the fact. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. I, I would love to see those numbers. I'm sorry I'm not on intergovernmental affairs. I have a good record of attending the committees I'm on, and I don't think I should have to be defensive about asking questions about $4 million when everyone's asking questions about $42,000. This is a major amount of money. I think we should be digging in as to whether or not every single penny we're spending of the $4 million needs to be spent on that. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Um, any other further questions or comments? Um, Councilmember Cunningham, Councilmember Schrader. Sure, and actually just to follow up on that, one other issue uh, that hasn't been mentioned, like we have, this is all due to a law change at the state capitol, um, allowing no excuse absentee voting, which is different than early voting, even though we switched the terms. And you will use the terms interchangeably, and, and it's more expensive. Like, it, it is ridiculous. I'm sorry, I worked on the policy, so I have some feelings about it, but it is something that um, we, it is a larger cost that we're doing no excuse absentee instead of true early voting. Um, I also in the IGR, that's the, one of the suggestions they've made is to work and continue that work and to make sure that we have early voting because it's not just a big expense here, it's a big expense for every county, every municipality across the state um, and for something that's so important as elections. Thank you, Councilmember Gordon. I think this is certainly something worth discussing, and it is a lot of um, funding. And I think one of the problems is that we got uh, we're forced to have another extra election this year or next year that we never had before. I am curious if the um, and maybe I should know this already, but um, is the early voting and are the vote centers going to be um, activated for that? Um, primary that happens early in the year as well, or are these just for the general election? Because we have to have two primaries now and one general election. So um, 
I guess a breakdown would be helpful for us to see in case we could come up with some idea like, okay, well, let's not do as much for one of these primaries and save a little money so we can put it where it needs to, but maybe you've already done a lot of that and the 46 um, days just for the general election and the early vote centers are just for the general election and so there's not much savings anyway. Madam Chair, in respect to the council's time, I don't have all of those numbers with me. I certainly can bring them. We are slated to come to the council for our next, well, to the Elections and Rules Committee for our next update on plans and preparations for next year's elections, uh, and certainly can have all of that in hand and present to you a fairly detailed breakdown of how our plans built into the ultimate budget and where we're looking to uh, allocate those for each of those three events. And so if, if the council wishes to have that at that, I can certainly be prepared to speak to that at the next committee meeting. And just one last um, question. So if it's the state legislature that's forcing us to have this additional primary, did they allocate any funding to support local election offices to do this? The state did allocate some funding and gave authorization to the Secretary of State to bring back a, a revised estimate, which has been done. The state identified certain categories of expenses which are eligible for reimbursement. Not all of our expenses will be eligible for reimbursement. Some of them will. And we have already submitted our estimate to the Secretary of State's office, um, which I believe in part was what caused the Secretary to go back and revise their initial estimate um, with the legislature. It was much higher, I think, than people maybe have assumed. Okay, thank you. I would suggest that if, um, in collaboration with the chair of the Elections Committee, Councilmember Ellison, that maybe that would be an appropriate thing, but I would leave it between him and you to decide what's on that agenda. Council President Bender. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the detailed discussion because it is a large change. I did want to reflect or pull out a couple points. The first is I agree that it's best to budget ahead as much as we can. Um, I represent one of the wards where folks are often standing in long lines outside trying to register in wards that have high renter populations like mine. Lots of folks are registering the day of. I was in um, a University of Minnesota precinct uh, last election cycle. There were students waiting for three hours mm -hmm. to register, even with the capacity that we had. Um, so that's about, we're see this is about holding equal, right, in the capacity that we're providing. So. Um, this is an issue that affects wards that have, I think, you know, um, there's a reason that wards have lower voter turnout than some wards have lower voter turnout than others. And I think us putting resources into helping folks know they can vote early, but also knowing that in a lot of places, folks are probably going to show up on election day with a lot of questions, wanting to register on the day of, and that really it's, you know, that um, having the resources there to provide that service, I think, is really important. Um, so I appreciate all the work that's gone into this, and I think there's lots of interest in follow-up, so we should get those meetings on the calendar. Thank you. Thank you. I needed to restart my computer, so I lost speaker management for a moment. Are there any other questions or comments? I'm not seeing any. Thank you, Mr. Carl. Thank you. We're going to move right ahead to our communications department, and with us is Ms. Bergstrom. Thank you for being here, Director. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you, Chair Paul, Paul Masano, excuse me, and council members. Uh, my name is Greta Bergstrom. I'm the Director of Communications for the City of Minneapolis, and here to present Mayor Fry's recommended 2020 budget for the City's Communications Department. As an internal service department, uh, we provide strategic communications services to departments across the enterprise in really three primary areas or buckets. Uh, the first is media relations, kind of uh, slightly more traditional um, interaction with local, state, um, and national news media, occasionally international news media, um, as well as digital communications, which is our really biggest growth area. That's the production of video content, live broadcasts like uh, meetings like these of over 300 government meetings annually, um, social media and digital content development work for the city's new website, which I'm happy to say will be brought online at the end of December of this year. And then strategic marketing, which really includes a big bucket of um, message development, um, paid media uh, where needed, uh, graphic design and internal employee communications. We also provide a variety of um, training opportunities for city staff, um, including on-camera media training, quarterly writing to audience training, and our finalizing curriculum for social media training sessions um, to facilitate implementation of the city's new adopted social media policy. 
In the mayor's recommended budget for next year, our department staffing remains level at 12 FTEs with a total department budget of 2.18 million proposed for 2020. Um, I just wanna say the 12 FTEs really um, work cross-functionally across kind of those three buckets. Um, so I have staff that anchor each of those, but really I can't think of one staff member that does not kind of cross over uh, and work together um, to develop um, different communication solutions for uh, those in the enterprise. 472,000 of the total department budget um, is direct funding to operate the city's uh, public access TV channels. Um, we currently have an annual contract um, with Minneapolis Telecommunications Network, MTN, and these dollars uh, provide access to television broadcast equipment, training and airtime on three channels, channel 16, 17, and 75. Um, I will say that moving forward um, with council approval and the PRC approval, we just issued an RFP this week um, and are looking at proposals due December 9th um, for the selection of the city's vendor for next year for public access services. Mayor Fry has recommended if to I could pause you there. Oh, sure. Um, Director Brickstrom, Council President Bender. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Do the 12 FTEs include those that are within departments like MPD or CPED? Uh, Chair Palmasano, Council President Bender, um, those FTEs do not. Those just include um, the 12 within my department within city communications. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mayor Fry has recommended two change items for 2020. The first is for $55,000 in one-time funding to continue our culturally relevant in language radio programming in order to ensure ongoing access um, and information for our diverse resident base. Um, this funding would cover an annual contract with four different stations um, hosting our newest program, Minneapolis 360, which is twice per month on Camo J. Um, our bi-weekly Spanish language radio show on La Raza, which I'm proud to say is now in its fourth year. Um, La Raza's uh, program was the city's first pilot program um, and it has been very successful. Um, we also have monthly radio programs on Somali American Radio, K-A-L-Y, and Hmong Radio on W-I-X-K. Um, communication staff produce seven to eight radio programs per month, um, working to develop informational messaging on topics ranging from the budget process to Census 2020, to public safety initiatives like group violence intervention. Um, program staff schedule the city staff subject matter experts from departments across the enterprise to appear on these programs to provide the information um, and dialogue. I will say that as we have added these seven to eight programs to our workload and increased from La Raza to the four different stations over the last three years, we have not come to council and asked for an additional FTE. We have been able to redistribute some of the workload um, within our department, um, having a staff member who has served as a producer on the radio programs, which is not an insignificant amount of work. And I think we're at a point where um, that may need to change at some point, but we're, we're doing okay at this stage. That includes uh, managing the contracts with the station, providing oversight of the bonus, um, PSA, public service announcement, radio spots, such as for snow emergency or street sweeping that we roll out kind of on a seasonal basis, and making sure that we are working um, at scheduling the appropriate topics um, in a seasonal manner that are timely for our audiences. And it's really important to acknowledge that our department works in very close partnership with NCR, uh, community relations staff, who um, provide, serve as hosts of the four different um, programs. We have Mariano Espinosa uh, as host on La Raza, Newman Sheikh, Somali American Radio on KLY, Michael Yang um, serves as a program host for Hmong Radio, and Anthony Taylor is our newest host on uh, Minneapolis 360 on KMOJ. And the second um, change request is for $30,000 in one-time funding to extend our service maintenance contracts for 2020. This is really providing ongoing technical uh, support, repair support for um, the city's audiovisual equipment, playback servers for the council chamber system, and then also making sure that our video and audio streaming services um, are extended, our music licensing is extended. 
And uh, with this, this concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to stand for questions. Thank you. I do want to remind colleagues that maybe aren't on the Enterprise Committee that we just had come back a pretty extensive communications audit, and it doesn't seem that those recommendations, obviously, we're not, we didn't receive those or work on those in time for the mayor's 2020 budget, but I do hope to see some uh, requests coming forward to help fulfill what I think are all some really good recommendations. Council Member Fletcher. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. I was going to make a similar point, but I, I also wanted to ask in, in the item about extending video services, does that include extending video coverage of meetings that are currently not covered, for example, the Charter Commission and the um, Heritage Preservation Commission? Chair Palmasano, Council Member Fletcher, uh, that does not include that. Um, that would require an additional staff in our video services department um, to provide the work uh, to broadcast those additional uh, programs. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments from my colleagues? I'm not seeing any. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Moving right along, we are a little bit behind. Um, our last one before we break for lunch is the city coordinator and IGR budget requests. Um, we will have Ms. Walchek come and give that departmental presentation. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Danielle Shelton Volchek. I'm the Director of Strategic Initiatives for the City Coordinator's Office, and I'll be presenting the Mayor's proposed budget for our office for 2020 with my colleague, Andrea Larson, who is the Director of Strategic Management for our office. Who we are and what we do. The City Coordinator's Office provides strategic and operational oversight to the city government through administration and partnerships, our first arm, strategic management, and strategic initiatives. The administration and partnership arm oversees the coordinator departments and management of council-approved um, partnerships. The management arm oversees um, the operational direction of the city and the initiative side provides the strategy building and oversight of citywide initiatives critical to the business success of the enterprise and which also meet stakeholder needs. But in addition, our office works to incubate and accelerate innovative solutions to long-standing problems and or emerging issues in ways that are aligned with our city's values, goals, priorities, and approved plans. Recent examples of that have been the small business team, which was incubated in our office, as well as cultural districts. Now I'm going to turn the podium over to my colleague, Andrea Larson. She's going to discuss our current service level and start the conversation about our change items. Thank you. Welcome, Ms. Larson. Thank you. Good morning, council members. I'll start at a high level for the overall office and can answer questions about program areas if there are any. The coordinator's current service level is quite a bit lower from prior years adopted budget due to a number of one-time funds that occurred in 2019, the details of which you can see on the slide. The CSL also decreased due to cost allocation decreases. Additionally, we've dropped two grant-funded FTE from the performance and innovation team in strategic management and moved one FTE from administration and partnerships to strategic management to support that work. I'll next talk about change items under strategic management and administration and partnerships, starting with the new public service area. This change item is to provide $700,000 in ongoing and $600,000 in one-time general fund resources for staffing and technology costs to support the development and long-term functioning of the public service area, or the PSA. The public service area will be the customer service interface to all city services located on the second floor of the new public service building. This request is coming out of the coordinator's office as a placeholder. The departmental reporting structure for the PSA, the staff and the functions, is yet to be determined. The amount for this request does not represent the amount needed for the entire PSA. 
You'll see in the change item form that $350,000 in ongoing costs will be offset by savings to be found in other departments through attrition and operational efficiencies associated with the launch of the PSA. As this work is still emerging, we've not yet outlined where these efficiencies will be gained, and we know too that we will likely need to provide greater support as we launch the PSA for a su successful start in October. However, over time, we do anticipate that there are efficiencies to be gained from operating in the same space. This requests support direction approved by the Facilities, Space, and Asset Management Committee, FSAM, and is what the PSA needs to be up and running for fall, uh, fall 2020 launch. Today, residents or customers who work with the city have multiple touch points across a variety of geographic locations when they'd like to receive a service. Departments and staff have done an excellent job providing first-class service given the current structure. The opportunity to provide a more seamless and consolidated service area, which better suits the needs of customers and staff alike, arose with the concept of the new building. As you can read, the purpose of the PSA is to co-locate multiple city services in one geographic location and to provide a consistent front office experience regardless of the service customers seek. The PSA will feature a welcoming customer-centric space where new PSA staff will solve problems at first contact and complete on-the-spot transactions. These new staff will be similar to 311 agents, but they will have the ability to complete simple transactions quickly for those who need fast service, like paying bills. When there are more in-depth questions which require greater expertise, PSA staff will provide a warm handoff to subject matter experts from departments. Providing these new and consolidated services will make working in and with the city easier and more efficient. The staffing model used as a foundation for this request was developed after months of work to complete initial mapping of the types of transactions, minutes per transaction, and volume of transactions we anticipate these new staff handling. This mapping was completed by departments providing these services today including CPED, Finance, Health, Reg Services, HR, the Assessor's Office, and others. The number of staff represented here include two levels of PSA staff, seven entry-level positions, and two senior-level positions, as well as two supervisors to manage shifts. These funds will also support uh, one-time money for startup of the PSA through a project manager and business mapping analyst, and a combination of one-time and ongoing technology costs to support operating in the new space, from software that allows for single payment transactions to the hardware staff will need in order to operate. Are there any questions on the PSA? I don't see any. Thanks. Thank you. The next change item is for program evaluation. Um, it's to provide $70,000 in one-time funds with a $30,000 department contribution for testing a program evaluation function at the city. Program evaluation is a tool or methodology which helps us better understand what works and should be scaled up, opportunities for improving existing programs, and evaluating, evaluating what is no longer meeting intended outcomes. These funds will help us pilot potential internal evaluation function models. An evaluation function is an individual team or an external partner who's responsible for scoping, designing, and running evaluations. Though program evaluation happens in pockets of the city, especially grant-heavy areas, there's been an uh, increasing need to consider evaluations enterprise-wide. For example, we heard during results presentations the need to better report on outcomes. We've seen a number of staff directions regarding program evaluation like city inspections and community engagement, and we know through assessments of the city on national standards for best practices that program evaluation is something we should be doing in a more consistent way. A designated evaluation function provides several advantages over this more ad hoc approach, including increased efficiency from better coordination, ability to have access to individuals with specialized evaluation capabilities, and the ability to monitor long-term results. We've already partnered with the Behavioral Insights team, uh, BIT, to scope three potential evaluation function models. BIT is uh, internationally recognized for their work to generate and apply behavioral insights to inform policy, improve public services, and deliver positive results. We'll continue to work with BIT as a technical assistance provider, and we'll use these funds to hire short-term support and program-related expenses as we scope this work. Councilmember Cunningham. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm very excited about this. Um, <laughs> as someone who's been very insistent about outcomes-based information, um, 
I, I also really, um, I'm excited about the approach with behavioral insights. I think that that's really um, one of the things that I have found very challenging um, being an elected official in a government system is that a lot of times we govern and build systems in ways we want people to behave rather than the ways that they actually do behave. And so I think that it's important for us to, to really be thinking about how human behavior and allowing that to drive how we are measuring success. So I think that that's really exciting. Um, my question is, how do you see this uh, connecting? So there's there's a few areas um, that I I feel like there might be some disconnects. Like we, we want to have evaluation, but um, how, is that connected to results? Is that connected to the budget? Um, how do we, you know, if we're allocating money one year for a particular use and then the department has the discretion the department head has the discretion to reallocate those dollars the following year like how are we actually going to then be able to consistently track that so there are just some i want us to be evaluating but i don't want us to be evaluating for evaluation's sake but like to actually like have an interconnected process and and like are we doing it for the strategic racial equity plan. So how does this all fit together and what exactly are we evaluating? Uh, Chair Palmazano, Councilmember Cunningham, that's a great question. That's one of the reasons why we're um, suggesting to pilot this work first before we um, determine a long-term investment is because um, part of what we're doing normally the way BIT works is they come in and will help you um, actually uh, test or try an evaluation or randomized control trials or a variety of behavioral um, interventions at your city. And we've asked them to um, help us design a function and figure out where evaluation should live in the city and how it should, in what way it should be connected to our work, and then test that on a specific project. And so um, it's working with them a little bit differently to make sure that we're um, deciding, you know, three of the models that we're looking at are an FTE program evaluator in-house at the city. There's also options to have communities of practice across departments. And we could also just have a partner outside the organization with whom we regularly work um, to have sort of an external perspective. Um, and we want to make sure that whatever model we choose, we're, we're, we're selecting that model based on um, the outcomes that we want to see um, from an evaluation function. And that includes, as I mentioned, making sure that it's um, connected to results. We've had extensive conversations with the budget office about how we connect it to um, budget and to making decisions um, and also connected to just doing our work better. And that's, that is one of the benefits of having program evaluation. However, it ends up looking um, in a more consistent way at the city is that it does, you know, they have a lot of evidence that shows it does help us support long-term um, tracking of those results so that we can see the impacts that it's had over time. Great, I, I really appreciate that explanation and the clarification. Um, one of the things I, I just want us to be mindful of is that we are making the clear connections between the various documents that have been created. Mm -hmm. um, and this is larger than just you, but just like overall we have disparate plans and budget and result process, and we don't have a clear thread that is connecting all of them. And so, the, you know, we can have the option of, are we going to very specifically say, is this program or investment producing a particular outcome? Or <coughs> if we're looking to improve the quality of people's lives, that's the societal outcome that we're aiming for. Are we measuring that, you know, like the connections between the system and if we are achieving that? And so, um, so, I, I would like for us to continue having these conversations. I'm sure it'll be big in the enterprise department, but or excuse me, committee. But um, I I just want to make sure that when we're talking about evaluation, that we're not putting systems into place that, that are reinforcing the siloed nature of the city, because we know just public administration research really shows that 
when we are being intentional across departments and collaborating from that perspective and looking at higher level societal outcomes rather than just like departmental outcomes, we can increase the efficiency of the departments, but that does not necessarily inherently improve the outcomes on a societal level. So, um, so I just want us to be mindful about where we're measuring and, um, and that we're overall in, in improving folks' quality of life and we're measuring that. I will just jump in and offer that that is my full intent with all of the time that we all spend on results work is to marry these two processes. You know, on this topic, the health inspection study was a program evaluation and it's already informing budget choices. Mm -hmm. So Council Member Cunningham, you're spot on and this aims to build on that. Is there anything else you wanted to offer on that topic, Ms. Larson? Chair Palmisano, that's a great answer. It was the one I had ready to give as well. So thank you for that. Super. Next, we have enterprise engagement, um, which is $100,000 in one-time uh, funds. It offers an opportunity for the city to respond to emerging issues and priorities in culturally responsive ways. Funding ensures resources are efficiently tailored and effectively spent on the right type of outreach at the right time for the right people, maximizing impact and access. The EDT leverages a cross-departmental, one-stop, and consulta consultative approach for departmental and citywide initiatives. Examples of this work in the past include, um, in 2019, the funds were largely used for enterprise audit on communications. Um, they've been used for minimum, minimum wage enforcement outreach to help businesses understand the rules and guidelines after the first year of enforcement. Um, encampment outreach and communications, facilitation of the opioid task force, leveraging Spanish language radio to reach out to Latino communities like La Raza radio station for translation services to broadcast public messages in Spanish and a number of other initiatives. If there are no further questions, I'll hand it back to Danielle to cover the remaining change items. I'm not seeing any, thank you. Thanks. So I'll be covering the remaining change items under strategic initiatives and one under administration and partnerships. So we'll start here with sustainability. This represents a 260,000 ongoing appropriation into the budget. 60,000 of this will be used for commercial, commercial and residential benchmarking energy evaluations. Recently, the city created rules requiring energy evaluations for commercial and residential buildings. As we know through other cities like Denver, New York, and Seattle, that evaluations can actually decrease energy use by three to 5% annually. Today, utilities covers the cost for residential evaluations, but not commercial. And this change item would cover the cost for commercial property owners to incentivize participation in benchmarking and increase the number of energy evaluations. This would also help us to meet our climate action plan goal of reduced energy by 30% by the year 2025. This change item, uh, $200,000 of it, also supports expanded funding, funding for the city's green cost share for 4D and naturally occurring affordable housing or NOAA. As a strategy to reduce long-term costs for building owners to help maintain more affordable rents, sustainability and the Green Business Cost Share Program are providing matching funds to property owners to install energy efficient improvements and rooftop solar. This is another way to incentivize our property owners. This funding will support reduced energy costs for the nearly 1,000 families who rent apartments that are enrolled in 4D and other NOAA properties. Are there any questions in regards to the sustainability change? There are not, thank you. Thank you. The Creative City Challenge, or CCC, this represents a $100,000 appropriation with a $20,000 contribution from our office. The Creative City Challenge has been in our office since 2013. And according to the Americans for the Arts, the average size of a public art project is $100,000. But programs of this size frequently have portfolio requirements for the artist, including proposal development, in project implementation. 
CCC is that entry point for artists. Because without the first opportunity to work on a project of this scale, artists, particularly those of color, lack the experience to get major art projects. The CCC helps build an artist's portfolio and positions them competitively for larger commissions that they may not have had access to otherwise. Since 2013, CCC has supported 33 emerging artists. 13 of those artists have been artists of color. 10 of those artists have been women. In 2020, we see CCC as supporting the cultural district's work as outlined in the 2040 plan by making tangible the narratives and experiences of communities who do not have access or influence to, influence to those downtown public art spaces. Commissioned artwork could be placed in cultural districts if related directly to the district's heritage and narrative as an artistic cultural example of what is coming out of those communities. Questions? Council Member Goodman. Thank you, I have a whole myriad of questions about this. I've sure. been on the panel for many, many years and I don't recall lots of communities of color and women getting these commissions. In fact, I rec if I remember correctly, it was mainly combinations of architects and landscape architects mm -hmm. who were working to do things at the convention center and it just re recently moved to the commons. Um, so I'm wondering, first of all, is this 100000 in addition to the money that's already going into it? And then also, where is the money coming from? The original Creative City Challenge funding was coming out of the sales tax revenue because it was done at the convention center. Uh, so is this sales tax revenue and then this is general fund money? Can you explain to me the total amount of money being spent on this? Yes, um, Chair Palmasano, Councilwoman Goodman. So. Um, to kind of go to your first point, um, we actually ran the data numbers since 2013 on where these commissions went. Um, and so we're confident in the 13 of them or 40% of them over the total time that the, that the um, Creative, City Challenge, Creative, Creative City Challenge has been in place that they have gone to artists of color and tend to women. Usually for this program, um, it is a cost between $100,000 and $130,000. Um, and we work in conjunction, as you know, with um, Northern, Northern Lights. I'm afraid that um, I can't speak to um, additional funding on this um, particular change item. What I can do is um, I can um, provide that information for you um, after this presentation, and I apologize for that, but I'm not able so to Madam do that. Chair, I'm confused. If, if this is a change item, there must be a budget for it in addition to this hundred thousand dollars, right? Well, we have. Yes, I, I imagine so. But when we're talking about specific numbers, I'm afraid that I I don't have that. I'm going to switch That's this what over. I mean. Let's move this question over to Director Intermo. So, um, Madam Chair and Council Member Goodman, the Creative City Challenge is um, one of those uh, recurring one-time change items that we see in in the budget. So, there, um, you know, speaking from the top of my head, there's not a obviously there's a base for arts in the city coordinator's right. office, but not for the Creative City Challenge specifically. I know it has been in the, fa in the past funded in the convention center, and as you'll recall, the convention center, all of the sales tax used to be receded to the general fund, and then a portion transferred out to the convention center. At about the same time that that treatment changed, the funding also moved from uh, the convention center for the Creative City Challenge to the city coordinator's office. And so I, I have done some research on this issue in the past and I can get with uh, Ms. Shelton Walzik and we can get you an answer. Okay, that would be great because what I don't want to see is more money spent downtown. What I do want to see is money spent in cultural corridors 
on public art projects. Mm -hmm. um, I really feel, and we're in, you know, in the middle of this kind of arts conversation, and this is a perfect example. I'm not questioning how you count the people of color who are included, but these are teams of like six people. So if they have one person of color of six, then that whole team counts as a person of color. I mean, it, I, I served on the jury for this for like five years. And so I just cannot imagine we would say this was an opportunity as it should be for various communities that have not gotten these kinds of commissions. Often they were just groups of people who were like, hey, we've got this cool idea. We're going to put up these sunflowers with solar panels on them and create them in a circle at the convention center. That's what it's been. One year we did this gigantic like balloon thing. So I mean, I, I don't know. I kind of think that this could be much better focused in the overall area of public art. It wouldn't be my intent to take this out, not do it. I just think it should be coordinated with a larger art arts as economic development strategy. And so I want I would like to know from staff more about is it 100,000 every year and it's a change item because it's a one time thing? Is this adding to it? What's the source of the funding? And how does this better fit into the overall arts and the creative economy and economic development work we're doing? Chair Palmasano, um, Councilwoman Goodman, I can tell you out of that, um, out of what you just said, that this has been continuing one time funding um, that has been going, that, so it has not been ongoing. Um, the second thing that I can say is, um, yes, as I, as I indicated for 2020 and a scene beyond what culture, what CCC will be doing is being, is being embedded in cultural districts and raising up those areas and neighborhoods and those voices through um, the Creative City Challenge. So I don't think that we're at crosshairs about the intention moving forward for, cons for the CCC. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I, just, I don't even know we need to do this. I just think there should be money set aside for cultural districts, public art, and not even call it this because there is a history here. I'll also note Northern Spark's not happening next year. So um, Northern Spark was part of the impetus for doing this, but they're taking a break. And so perhaps we could take a break, allocate this money to our, whatever we determine our new arts and economic development program is and try to create something cool out of that rather than going back to the way we've always done it on the Convention Center Plaza or at the Commons. Uh, those are not places that need more people. I, I think some of these cultural corridors could actually do something cool with this money and that would be a lot of money for them in the Commons and at the Convention Center. It's like a drop in the bucket. Thank you. I think we can just take that as a comment unless you have something to share. Um, I, I, I just wanted to ask Chair Palm, or add Chair Palmasano, Councilwoman Goodman. Yes, you're right. Northern Sparks is taking a break in 2020 to reevaluate their programming. And then in turn, that will force us because we've always partnered with them in the CCC to evaluate this programming. But also when it, we are talking about and viewing it in a lens of how it can support cultural districts, it requires us to step back anyway, right? And see how this program can be yes, best utilized in, in, the, in the neighborhoods and in the space with that community. So that's been the intention. So Northern Sparks is just another impetus to that, but that would already have to be done. I don't want to belabor this, but my understanding with this budget item is that there is already a location selected and is part of the budget item and that it maybe is not a proposal that's in an existing cultural district or corridor. Is that correct? Chair Palmasano, so there were, um, there were locations that were identified for the Creative City Challenge, um, certain cultural corridors that were identified. What we have to determine, because usually the cultural, the city, the Creative City Challenge usually takes place in the downtown, in downtown, in a larger park space. So what we have to do is we have to come back, look at those particular locations and see how we can shift the program and maximize its benefit in those particular locations that have been identified. I think you're hearing that there's a great interest from the council in doing that, so. I, I am hearing that. <laughs> The next change item is a senior advisor to the city on exploitation, exploitation and human trafficking. This represents a $52,000 one-time appropriation um, with a $20,000 contribu $20, contribution from our office. 
The city actually began its human trafficking work in early, um, as early as 2013 with the Juvenile Exploitation Work Group. And it was through that work group and that work that it became increasingly apparent that a dedicated position was necessary. So as a result, the city applied for the Pathways to Freedom grant and received that funding in um, February of 2018. That grant ends in June of 2020. So this change item seeks to fill the remainder of that 2020 gap. As such, the funding would allow um, the senior advisor to not only continue to identify gaps in our city functions, our policies, even in our considerations and discussions in regards to human trafficking. It will also allow the advisor to continue to educate or create protocols to identify and respond to human trafficking, not only internally within the city enterprise, but also externally. And this change item also supports the city's public safety priority of operationalizing a strategy to eliminate disproportionate impact of violence. Is there any questions? Not that I'm seeing from my colleagues. Next change item, try and change item is the Gender Equity Summit. Is, this represents a $15,000 appropriation. Um, the inaugural uh, summit took place in 2014, and it wasn't until last year, um, in 2018, that the Race Equity Division took ownership of the summit. This year, the summit, which took place um, at the Walker, had 450, approximately 450 attendees, which is double. Um, the attendance when the summit first started. This change item will continue to support the summit, which has set, quite frankly, Minneapolis apart as a leader in the nation. To our knowledge, there is no other city who seeks to engage and support their transgender community in this way and in the other ways that we do in Minneapolis. This change item will allow us to contract for service providers, which the department anticipates will benefit the city's target market program, as well as transgender and gender nonconforming community. This work, this change item, will also support the goal of SREAP, the Strategic Racial Equity Action Plan, which is, tells us to work to increase our spend with diverse vendors and it will also support the enterprise's economic inclusion goals. Any questions? If I could pause you there, I think this is another example of being able to be forward thinking and planning for things that we already do instead of incurring them as an expense on the back end. Council Member Cunningham. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So um, I do believe this has been in the budget since like 2015. 15 um, and because at or at least the 20 I think 2016 budget but it was during the 2015 process um, so I thought I remembered quite clearly because I was in the mayor's office at that time that this was supposed to be ongoing dollars um, and it so I'm, I'm disappointed to see that that seems to have been lost in um, communication over time because I was very surprised as well as other folks that this was one-time dollars um, and so uh, I just want to name that we have quite a lot of trans equity related work that is happening throughout the city um, between the trans issues work group the transgender equity council is the, the it's um, listed here but then also uh, we have lots of gr a growing body of work and we don't have any ongoing dollars that are invested in this um, it's also worth noting that we don't have a permanent position that's staffing this work um, we originally were going to earlier this year we were going to have a contract um, for like 10 or 15 hours um, and you know i pushed back on that because it's like we're asking folks who are already intersectionally marginalized in a lot of ways to take on contracts that is does not fairly compensate them and so i worked with the city coordinator um, to have a halftime fte come in but that runs out at the end of this year um, I think that the trans equity work really um, 
overall is really critical and we are generally speaking, um, and this is a larger comment, not just to you, uh, we're, we're not really talking about um, the LGBTQ community overall. Um, we have a very large uh, community that's out and uh, when we think about equity, there are fewer communities you have like folks with disabilities um, where you get to see a cross sector of all sorts of identities represented within that community and the LGBTQ community is one of those as well. Um, and so I think that it's important when we're talking about equity to think about the intersectional component of it. Additionally, the $15,000 um, as originally was uh, recommended was not meant just for the summit, but uh, for multiple engagement events throughout the entire year. So I just want to, uh, cause we cannot just think about a one and done when it comes to engaging with a community that has been marginalized from um, engaging directly with systems like City Hall. And um, so I just wanted to share that and um, am grateful for this being included and just want us to think long term and sustainably about how uh, trans and queer um, equity fits into our equity conversation overall. Thank you, Councilmember Jenkins. Thank you, Chair Promisano. Um, I just wanted to speak to the broader challenges that are impacting the um, transgender community and, and to emphasize how really important this work is. Um, at the federal level, we see this community being um, attacked on multiple levels um, from being denied opportunities to serve our country in the military to being denied opportunities to um, seek homeless shelters, um, as well as being denied opportunities to seek medical um, assistance in hospitals and in clinics. I mean, um, medical doctors based on religious beliefs have been given the right to discriminate against transgender people um, to provide them health care services, as well as the ability to work and earn a living or to rent an apartment is currently being discussed by the United States Supreme Court. And based on this court's um, past um, actions, transgender people, and as well as the more broader LGBT community, will likely be denied the opportunity to work and um, seek safe and affordable housing in this country. And so just really want to highlight these, um, these affronts to this community and, and lift up the work that we are trying to accomplish in this community um, and the need for for more resources and, and I think particularly for a, um, at minimum, a staff person to, um, to really work on the growing body of work that um, Councilmember Cunningham identified. Um, as you noted, uh, Ms. Um, um, I'm sorry. Okay, Shelton Balchak. <laughs> yeah, Shelton Balchak. Um, the summit has grown uh, every year since its inception. And this past year, um, it um, the attendance was around 450 people. Yep. And um, some of the things that I have heard from uh, participants is that this summit this work is absolutely essential to their survival mm -hmm. so i wanted to just make that um uh, point and and bring that awareness to my colleagues thank you i can continue um yeah we'll take that as a comment i also wonder you know um perhaps we shouldn't be calling this line item in our budget the transgender equity summit given that it seems that we're working on several things throughout the year. Maybe this mm -hmm. is something we should redefine and then be able to expand as we as we can. So just a comment to my colleagues on that. Uh, Ms. Wolchek, you have one additional line item and we're over time here, so go ahead. I do, I will make it brief. Um, 
This falls under the administrative and partnership arm of the city coordinator's office, and at last, this is partnerships. This represents a 480, excuse me, 485,000 one-time appropriation to the current budget. Uh, the coordinator's office has been responsible for the oversight of various enterprise partnerships and ensures that all contracts and agreements comply with the appropriate city provisions. Such contracts vary from year to year, and this request will provide continuous funding for those citywide partnership agreements that have been authorized and approved by the city council. Many of these partnerships provide invaluable support in collaboration and efforts to help move this enterprise forward, not only in its values, but also in its relationships. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues on this specific change item? I'm not seeing any. All right, Thank this you. concludes the coordinator's budget. Any other questions on the coordinator's budget, including IGR, which doesn't have any change items this time around, but questions or comments from my colleagues? I'm not seeing any. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to point out to my colleagues that per the questions about YCB, about the proportional sharing of funds for YCB, that information has been sent to all council members from our budget director, Mike Intermill, and I've asked that it be added to the record through our clerk, Peggy Menchek. I'd like to make a motion to receive and file these first five department briefings this morning. That would be the Health Department, the Youth Coordinating Board, City Council, City Clerk and Elections, Communications, the City Coordinator, and Intergovernmental Relations Committee meetings. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. We are going to adjourn and resume at 1.30 for the, for the next five departments today. Thank you for your time. I'm sorry, Council Member Gordon. Oh. Yes, all right. Yeah, we, because we are over, we'll resume at 1.30 and we'll consider if Director Ranieri is available at 1.30 <laughs> or we will fit him in some other time. Thank you.